Okay, so hello everyone. I figured that this is the last talk of today, so everybody is probably tired. So I'm going to start by showing you this piece of art, which we created and now used as the mural at the entrance of our department. So the title of this mural is called Physics Unified. What we try to show here is how from simple fundamental laws of physics, we get the complex world we are living in today. So what you see in the center here is an artistic version of an accelerator event display. And as you see, um, it represents the birth of matter. And then as you follow the trajectory of these particles and see that they interact and give rise to complex, interesting geometries and patterns at the atomic and the crystalline soft matter scales and eventually to the cosmic scales. So the theme here from simplicity to complexity actually has a little bit to do with what I'm going to talk about today on our recent work trying to go from geometrically frustrated assemblies to mechanical metamaterials. So what do we mean by that? So mechanical metamaterials, as many of you have already heard about, are engineered materials where by controlling the geometry and the structure of the material, we can obtain unusual mechanical properties, both at, uh, for static response and for waves. So to give you an intuitive example, here is a mechanical metal material uh, we made in this collaboration here. So it is an example of topological Maxwell lattice. And what it does is that uh, now in one phase, you can see that the edge of this lattice is soft. And uh, in a different phase of the same material, now this edge becomes rigid. You can push it around and it doesn't deform. And uh, you can easily transform this lattice between two different states reversibly, where we introduce a bistability to make this happen. So this is just one example uh, in the whole collection of the field of mechanical metamaterials. So there are many different types. You can achieve, for example, Poisson's ratio band structure engineering, which many of you are familiar with. And then now you can also achieve waveguides, topological edge modes, non-reciprocal wave propagation, and many other interesting emergent properties such as energy harvesting and the mechanologic. So it's a really vibrant new field. So currently, most of the ways people use to create mechanical metamaterials is something like this. So basically you use macro scale top-down methods to make these lattices. And the unit cells are typically at a millimeter, centimeter scale. So it will be really interesting to think about the way we assemble these using nanoparticles. Right? So the advantage is of course clear. You can obtain a metamaterial that is small. You can hold it in your hand and at the macro scale, it will appear to be a homogeneous material. So, and also it looks like this connection is rather straightforward because here the ingredient to get these special properties is the control of geometry and structure. And this is precisely what we spend so much time studying in nanoparticle self-assembly. We have pretty good knowledge about what kind of building blocks will give you what type of structures. So this looks like a perfect fit. So, However, as in the past a few years, we spend more and more, and more time to try to understand how to establish such a connection, it, now we understand better that there are actually a lot of challenges, and this is actually a very interesting physics question. So what are the challenges? Firstly, if you want to obtain an interesting mechanical metal material with special properties, most of the time, you cannot do it with a closed packed structure. You need the structure to be open, and sometimes you need a certain flexibility. You need to break various symmetries, such as inversion symmetry or time reversal symmetry, which are all challenging to make with nanoparticle assembly. And furthermore, you need to couple the nanoscale components to macroscale waves, which is also quite non-trivial. So arguably, we can say that mechanical metal materials in terms of nanoparticle self-assembly is a more difficult question than using nanoparticle assembly to make optical metal materials, because in addition to having all of these components to sit at the right place in space, you also need them to vibrate in the right way so that you have the right mechanical response. And also we need to scale them up so that we have a macro scale metamaterial that we can actually use. 
And uh, we also need a deep understanding of their interactions so we can predict the mechanical properties. So this looks kind of difficult, but at the same time, there are a lot of opportunities for new physics. So this is going to be my what's next statement for this conference. So firstly, from the point of view of mechanical metal materials, thinking about making them using nanoscale components gave us a whole set of new scales in terms of length, frequency, force, energy. So there is a lot of interesting new physics, chemistry, and the geometry to think about. At the same time, we also get new fundamental concepts that will be new for this field of mechanical metal materials. For example, geometric frustration that is intrinsic to these nanoparticle assembly problems and the phase transitions which often happen for nanoparticle assembly. And we can use that to transform these mechanical metal materials between different states. And furthermore, also intrinsic to nanoparticles, they also have interesting couplings to external fields such as ENM field and other types of external stimuli. And this can be used to introduce interesting active reconfigurable transformations and interesting responses for metamaterials. So there is a lot of opportunities for interesting new physics here and also as applications for nanoparticle assembly. So what I'm going to talk about today is just two small aspects of this whole set of questions. The first aspect is on geometric frustration, where I'm going to talk about uh, basically two groups of recent work we have been doing on studying geometric frustration in self-assembly and the geometric frustration, how it's used in metamaterials. So basically trying to explain why do we need this complexity and what do we gain physically by introducing geometric frustration and the complexity. And after that, I'm going to talk about another set of recent work we tried to do to both experimentally and computationally understanding mechanical properties of self-assembled structures. So let me start with this geometric frustration problem. So here, I'm going to give you a brief overview of this recent work we have done on frustrated self-assembly of non-Euclidean crystals of tetrahedral nanoparticles. This is done in collaboration with my former postdoc, Francesco, my colleague, Nick Kotov, and his postdoc, Jun, and also my uh, colleague, Kai. And uh, uh, this is a short uh, review version of a long talk I gave two weeks ago at the program. So basically, let me start from the experimental system. So in this experiment from Nick Kotov's group, they take these tetrahedral nanoparticles, which are coated with chiral ligands, and then they, these particles assemble and give rise to very interesting chiral structures at the micron scale. And at different conditions, they also obtain the other types of complicated structures like these bow tie like structures and the bundles. And in similar other types of nanoparticle ligand systems, they also obtain all kinds of interesting intricate curved shapes such as hedgehogs and these complicated shapes. So when we first look at this type of experiment, what really struck me as a theorist is where is this complexity coming from? You start from rather simple geometric shapes, in this case, just regular polyhedra. How do you get all this comp complexity? So the theory we propose to understand this problem is that the complexity comes from a geometric frustration. So what is the geometric frustration here? So it depends on who you talk to, right? So when you talk to a physicist about a geometric frustration, this is basically the picture that will come out. You will have, when you put antiferromagnetic interactions on a lattice where the faces have all the number of edges, then this spin doesn't know what to do. So that is the geometric frustration. However, the type of geometric frustration we're interested in understanding here is the, is the pure geometric version. So think about the five regular polyhedra we have. Out of them, we can think about which one can tile Euclidean 3D space with no frustration, which means that we can have 100% packing fraction and the perfect periodicity. It is known that only the cubes can do that. You have a cubic lattice, it's a perfect periodic lattice, and all of the space is filled. All other shapes are geometrically frustrated. So what do we mean by this? Take the tetrahedra as an example. You can take five of them almost forming a ring, but you have a small gap. You can take 20 of them almost forming an icosahedra. Again, you have these little gaps. The hypothesis we have here 
is that this type of frustration hinders the formation of long-range order in these self-assembly problems, and that gave rise to a controllable structural complexity, which can be used to generate all kinds of interesting self-assembled clusters. So, interestingly, uh, we can think about uh, how we can mathematically describe such a problem without uh, just starting from geometric frustration and then there's no order and there's nothing we can do about it. So one type of mathematical tool we can use here is the fact that the frustration we have with these shapes is actually an artifact of the flat space we are living in. If you are able to introduce a little bit of curvature in our space, you can actually close these gaps and get perfect crystals out of these geometrically frustrated shapes. So this is quite difficult to imagine spatially. So let me give you some simple examples. Let's start from a 2D example. Imagine you try to tile the plane using pentagons, and there is a geometric frustration because the interior angle is smaller than 2 pi over 3. So you will have these gaps. However, when you introduce some positive Gaussian curvature, you can perfectly close the gap, and you get a perfectly ordered structure, which is a dodecahedron. And in the last frame of this video, you see that when you project this image of the perfect dodecahedron to flat 2D space, you get a distorted image. This is because we are forcing this perfect structure from, two, from 3D to 2D. The actual structure in 3D is perfect in the sense that every, every pentagon is equivalent to another, to the other. And it is um, a perfect crystal where all of the nodes live on a two-sphere. So the three-dimensional version is very similar, actually, just a little more complicated to imagine. So now imagine we take these dodecahedra and try to pack them in three-dimensional space. The dihedral angle here is slightly smaller than 2 pi over 3, so you have these gaps. So you can first make 1D chains, which are not frustrated. But then when you try to put these 1D chains together to make a bundle, there are small gaps. That is the geometric frustration. But you can take two such pillars, each of them six, six 1D chains. And now you can introduce a little bit of positive curvature in the three-dimensional space. And this is going to close the gaps and it will also cause the chains to close back onto itself. And what you get is a perfect polytope, which is the generalization of polyhedra to high dimensional space. And this is a so-called 120 cell because it is a finite crystal that contains exactly 120 dodecahedra. And the topology here is exactly the same type of structure like what Ivan just talked about is a hop fabrication. So it looks to be distorted here, but the actual structure, which can be embedded in four dimensions, is a perfect crystal. Every dodecahedron are the same, and all of the nodes live on the surface of a sphere in four dimensions. Okay, so these are mathematical facts that has been known for a long time. And now what we try to do is to take this as the basis to build our theory to predict the assembly of complicated structures from geometrically frustrated building blocks. So I'm not going to go into too much mathematical detail of how we do this. Basically, the steps are such that we first take these frustrated shapes and say there is a particular rule we want to pack them. Say, for example, I want five of them to form a ring. So I need a little bit of curvature to close this gap. And by doing that, you can select the non-Euclidean space where these gaps close or the overlaps is banded to open. And that, from doing that, you get a non-Euclidean crystal. And then you can find the non-Euclidean metric and build a continuum theory where the actual metric of your assembled structure necessarily need to deviate from the non-Euclidean geometry because it cannot be embedded in our flat space. So you can write this as an elastic energy and include any other interactions in your problem and put it together and cut a portion of the non-Euclidean crystal and run a minimization problem to solve for the morphology. For this problem of tetrahedra, the morphology we find here are helicoids. 
and we can quantitatively calculate the shape, particularly the pitch of these helicoids, which is a function of the interaction parameters of this, of the tetrahedra. And we find the qualitatively agreement with experimentally measured pitch of these helicoids. And uh, here, by changing the solvent properties, they are able to change the electrostatic repulsion, and we can find that uh, the pitch of the helicoid changes. So currently, we are collaborating with Sharon Glotzer's group to simulate the self-assembly of these tetrahedral nanoparticles to see what is the right kinetic pathway that the particles can find each other and form these non-Euclidean crystals. In particular here, you can see this is one example of what we obtain. It is a perfectly ordered structure, although this order does not belong to our space. So as a result, you can see that this structure is splitting at the edges of the ribbons. Okay, so this is the first part of work I would like to talk about, which is on geometric frustration in self-assembly problems. In the next part, I would like to talk about the same type of geometric frustration and how it can be used to make interesting mechanical metal materials. So here I'll talk about a group of recent work where we studied fractional topological soliton excitations in non-Euclidean plates. And the theory part of this work is done in collaboration with Kai and the experimental part with Alan Aruda's group at U of M. So here, in order, so, so here to, to explain the motivation, let's go back to this sort of a summary of different types of geometric frustration. So this, is, this type of problem of frustrated magnetism has been studied for a long time in condensed matter physics. And the one thing we learned from this study is that when you put a frustration in a condensed matter system, you typically get a lot of ground states. You get an extensive or sub-extensive degeneracy of your ground states. And this kind of degeneracy gives you very interesting physics because the system becomes very sensitive. When you introduce a little bit of perturbation, you can break the degeneracy and you can get all kinds of interesting order and new topological states. So we are interested in Understanding this in, self, in the context of self-assembly and the mechanical metal materials, can we control and create degenerate ground states and see what kind of dynamics that gave us? So as a beginning project, we just look at this in continuum elasticity. Eventually, we want to do this for self-assembly problems, but this is like a small controllable system we are starting with. So basically, we look at the geometrically frustrated thin elastic bodies. For thin elastic bodies, it's known for a long time that you can write the elastic energy in continuum theory into a sum of stretching energy, which depends on the in-plane metric of the shape, and an out-of-plane bending energy, which depends on the curvature. So it is known that there are nonlinear compatibility conditions between the in-plane metric and the out-of-plane uh, curvature. And when you violate this compatibility, you get a geometric frustration. And fortunately, there are well-developed mathematical tools, such as described in this paper, that help us calculate the shape, the pre-stressed shape that minimize the energy of these kind of geometrically frustrated elastic bodies. And the new question we would like to consider here is what is the degeneracy? So do we get multiple ground states and what is the dynamics of the system when you have these multiple ground states? So in order to study that, we select a relatively simple beginning problem, which is the so-called minimal surface associated family of helicoids and catenoids. So basically, you can have a set of different shapes of this elastic ribbon. All of them have the same elastic energy to leading order. So this is our degeneracy. In particular, you can label all of these different shapes using a phase angle. So this is a U1 degeneracy. And then we can introduce a little bit of thickness and introduce a little bit of energy bias along this whole manifold of low energy states. So the two lowest energy states are the left-handed and the right-handed helicoids. Okay? And all of the other shapes are still in this low energy manifold, but they have slightly higher energy. So then to capture the dynamics of the system, we can write a simple continuum theory, which is based on this phase angle phi, which different phi represent different shapes. 
So we can write a simple one-dimensional elastic energy where this term represents the different energy of the different shapes, and this term is just a gradient. So we have two ground states of left-handed and right-handed helicoids. Okay? And when, if you're familiar with theories of solitons, topological solitons, you, you will see that there are soliton solutions to this elastic energy. And in particular, the phase can change by multiples of pi. And you can define a soliton charge, which is the change of the phase divided by 2 pi. And as a result, you have charge 1 solitons, where the shape change from helicoid to catenoid to the other helicoid and back to the same helicoid or charge one-half solitons, which separate left-handed and right-handed ground states. And this turns out to have an exact mapping to the continuum theory of dimerized antiferromagnetic spin chains that has been studied by Hodan in 1980s. So basically, you can have two types of dimerized 1D chain states. They are the degenerate ground states of this problem. And you can break a dimer and have a spin one excitation. And then you can break apart this pair of spin one excitation and you have a pair of spin one half excitation that is separated the two types of ground states. So as you move them apart, you flip the ground state in the middle to the other ground state, which is exactly analogous to what we have here. So this seems to be an interesting mathematical analogy, and this also gave us very interesting physical properties. Firstly, these are very robust topological excitations that you cannot get rid of locally. The only way of getting rid of it is to bring two of them together and annihilate them. You probably have experience with this if you have a very kinked high phone, phone, phone cord. And the only way to get rid of those kinks is to bring them together and annihilate them. So that is an example of a topological robustness. So this is different from other types of solitons, such as sine gordon solitons, which can be written in a very similar theory, but just differ by this factor of two. And what happens here is that you have only one ground state, and at the soliton, the phase changed by two pi. So for this type of excitation, it is possible to locally get rid of it, right? Because the left and the right are the same ground states. From far away, you would not know. But here, you cannot locally get rid of one fractional excitation. So we are interested in testing this in real physical systems as a first step. So we 3D printed such a helicoid. In particular, we 3D printed in a right-handed helicoid state. So it is stress-free when it's a right-handed helicoid. But then we twist it to a left-handed helicoid, which is a metastable state here. So that is the beginning of this video. And then if we release this helicoid, what you see is that a pair of topological fractional soliton will be generated at the top and at the bottom. And then they automatically travel to meet in the middle and annihilate with one another. So I'm going to play this video again. And uh, we find this to be a quite an interesting phenomenon because here we used dissipative material. The material here is very viscoelastic. And however, we can have a soliton that propagates without decreasing its speed. It can go arbitrarily far. And what happens is that you have stored elastic energy when the system is in this metastable state. And then when you release the system, this stored elastic energy becomes the kinetic energy of the soliton. And it will propagate until it annihilates with another fractional soliton. So currently, we are interested in finding this type of fractional excitation dynamics in self-assembled, geometrically frustrated systems. OK, so yes. So now I talked about the first part, and I'm going to move on, use the next several minutes to talk about the second part, where we try to characterize mechanical properties of actual assembled nanoparticle systems. So this is a collaboration with Chen Chen's group and the Wen Xiaopan's group where we try to look at assembly and the phonon modes of nanoparticle-based Maxwell lattices. So what are Maxwell lattices? This is a type of mechanical lattice which are at the verge of mechanical instability. So mathematically, you can define them as mechanical lattices where in the bulk, 
you have equal numbers of degrees of freedom and the constraints, so that places them at mechanical instability. And for simple screen mass networks, you can write this condition as coordination number divided by two equal to spatial dimension, or z equal to 2D, which many of you probably have seen in soft matter uh, community. And uh, here are two examples of such lattices, square lattice and Kagame lattice. Each of the sites here is four coordinated, so it's a maxo lattice in two dimensions. So the reason we are interested in these maxo lattices is because they have very interesting mechanical properties. The video I show here is one maxo lattice, and in particular, it's a topologically polarized maxo lattice, and you can get these topologically protected edge states that gave rise to this very interesting, robust mechanical response. Okay? So we are interested in understanding if we can make such thing using nanoparticles. And uh, this leads us to this recent work we have been doing with Chen Chen's group. So basically, they take gold nanocubes and uh, assemble them and uh, using her magic of liquid phase TEM to look at the real-time dynamics of the assembly and the vibration of the lattice. So here is one video of the assembly of these gold nanocubes. And as you can see, they make a rhombic lattice. So the first question we ask ourselves is why it's a rhombic lattice, right? So these particles have fourfold rotational symmetry. Why, do, why, why is that broken, right? So the simple explanation we have here is that it comes from next nearest neighbor interactions. So here, this is a co-screened calcula co model calculation of the interaction energy of these golden nanocubes. Because these nanocubes, if you look at the next nearest neighbor, when the network is tilted a little bit, it gives you a lower energy. So you have two energy minimum instead of one at the 90% bound angle. And this agrees well with what, our, what we observe from the experimental images. You can count the bound angle between in this lattice, and it is also a double well. And interestingly, as they change the ionic strength in this experiment, there is a transition between rhombic lattice and the square lattice. And this interestingly agrees with a prediction we made several years ago, where there is a fluctuation-driven first-order transition between rhombic lattice and the square lattice when you have thermal fluctuations. So this is an interesting story by itself, but what I would like to mainly talk about here are the phonon modes of these lattices, where we try to develop this new method based on liquid phase T and real-time dynamics to extract the phonon modes. So basically, we take the time sequence of the lattice where it's fluctuating, and uh, we can record the trajectories of each of the particles, and from good old statistical mechanics in equilibrium, you know that you can write down such relations where the correlation function of these particle fluctuations is equal to the inverse of the dynamical matrix. And we can build a simple models for the dynamical matrix based on harmonic and unharmonic springs for the angular interactions. And then we can fit the two sides of this equation and get these band structures. By this type of fitting, we can extract the spring constants that characterize the effective interactions of this lattice. And uh, these spring constants can then be compared to the spring constants that are calculated from cost grain modeling. And as you can see, they agree, the, they agree with one another in at least the order of magnitudes. So this type of method, we believe that not only help us characterize fluctuations, vibrational modes of these self-assembled structures, but also provides with provides us with a way to corroborate our modeling for the nanoparticle interactions, which can be very complicated to calculate. Okay, so one interesting feature I would like to point to are these soft phonons between the gamma and M point of this lattice. And these soft phonons are signatures of maxo lattices, which are at the verge of mechanical instability. And it's perhaps easier to see in this kind of two-dimensional plots where we have a heat map of the phonon, phonon fluctuation frequency as a function of kx and ky. And you see these soft phonons along these high symmetry directions. And we can 
repeat this at a different ionic strength and get a pretty similar results. So it's a quite a robust feature that we have these soft phonons in these maxwell lattices. And we also hypothesize that these soft phonons are what facilitate nonlinear rearrangements of these lattices, where the lattice can shift between left and right leaning rhombic lattice states. It, it starts from linear modes along these lines where the different rows share in different directions. And to provide a comparison, we also did the same type of analysis of a close packed structure, which is a hexagonal lattice composed of nano rods. Here, you can see that the same type of phonon fluctuation um, calculation will give us very isotropic dispersion relations. This is in contrast to the highly anisotropic Maxwell lattice results with directions of low energy phonons. And we, in particular, define this, this so-called Maxwellness, which is a measure of how close the lattice is to the ideal Maxwell lattice limit, which should be zero for ideal lattices because you should just have four coordinated simple um, spring mass networks. But we need a little bit of non we need a little bit of non nearest neighbor interactions in order to stabilize this lattice. Okay, so with this, I would like to um, just wrap up. So we described a number of beginning efforts in connecting nanoparticle self-assembly to mechanical metamaterials. And hopefully I can convince you here that there are a whole realm of interesting physics questions that we can explore. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and our support. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, I have a question about many things, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I will prioritize. So I will uh, ask about this last, the last example of, uh, of uh, Maxwell lattice. So we worked on something similar in the context of uh, actual perovskites, and what we found is that uh, this uh, 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 zero modes uh, or the existence of uh, mechanical instability somewhere there uh, not only gives this, of course, uh, form spectrum that you, uh, you've shown, but also gives a remarkable explanation for the negative uh, thermal expansion, yes. right? Because mm -hmm. there is um, uh, um, uh, uh, essentially entropic elasticity of associated with the zero modes and then uh, th th this Ther uh, negative thermal expansion that we normally associate with uh, soft systems like uh, polymer gels uh, can also be an explanation for hard matter systems like perovskites. So do you see anything like that in, 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 in this example that you uh, discussed? Yeah, that is a very good question. So, so I think uh, um, you can probably observe that in these twisted uh, Kagame lattices where thermal fluctuations will um, Will, will create a non-trivial effect to shrink and expand the lattice. For this one, the soft mode, the, for, for these rhombic lattices, the soft mode is, is shearing this lattice. So probably you won't see change of volume, but instead a, a, a more um, subtle effect of, of its shear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um. Are you able experimentally to tune that, whatever you call it, the maximalness? Yes. Are, are, are you able to, to do something that allows it to sort of have the angular interactions systematically increase so that you can actually see the soft modes sort of become less soft? Yeah, I think that is possible. So here, these angular interactions come from next nearest neighbor interactions. So if you are able to tune the range of the interaction, which I think can be achieved by changing ionic strength or other ways, definitely you can change this. Okay. Yeah. I'll ask a question. Yes. Um, so for the first part, right? So uh, these uh, tetrahedral particles that make these 
helical helical uh, assemblies. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming that it has to do with these chiral ligands. Yeah, and chiral ligands. And I didn't ligand, quite yeah. see how those entered in your in your you know uh, description of of the system in, in in four dimensions. Can you connect that for me? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So 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 the the 600 cell itself is a chiral. So, so that non-Euclidean crystal is a chiral, and how you cut it introduce the chirality. That's how theoretically it is done. Mm -hmm. But uh, the way how it cut it has to come from the chirality selection of the ligands experimentally. So basically, what the the scenario we are thinking about here is that uh, there is a natural tendency for chiral symmetry breaking as you form such structures, and uh, the chiral ligands just need to give the system a little bit of small signal that kick it either to the left potential well or the right potential well. And the way it works is actually a quite a subtle effect. So it introduces a small twist between the nanoparticles. And then that small twist select either left-handed or right-handed helicoids. So let me see if I have an image of that here. So. Yeah, this is a hidden slide I didn't show. So the one-dimensional chain structure, you can have both left-handed or right-handed version if you just put a chiral tetrahedra together. And it is our, our explanation is that it is the chiral ligands that select either left-handed or right-handed helicoids to start with. That is the kinetic pathway of this chirality. See. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have uh, oh, okay. um, maybe maybe one one question and one quick one um, uh, for the soft modes. Do you think that um, that the presence of soft modes would would alter the types of defects that form during self assembly? Um, and the very quick one is: Have you thought about other uh, Thurston geometries for these uh, for these frustrated particle assemblies? Yeah. So, firstly, I, I think soft modes versus defects. That's a very interesting question. We can already see that uh, it leads to. I only like showed one picture, but uh, we have a lot more pictures of these rearrangements. And it, it not only gave us these simple raw rearrangements, but the, the system can actually turn in two different directions. And you can have interesting junctions that are come from these soft modes. So, so there, there is definitely a, a lot to discuss there. So sorry, what was your second question again? The other question is, of you can there are other things other than spherical and hyperbolic spaces that, um, that exist, right? There are a broader class of Thurston geometries. Um, I'm wondering if, if you've thought about assembling something uh, that's uh, more exotic, that's in a more exotic space. Yeah, that's also very interesting. I think so far we have only studied isotropic S3 and H3. And if you have more exotic shape, the nanoparticles, you can kind of speculate what kind of non-Euclidean space that will lead to. And it's not obvious at all. At first, I sort of thought that you can always solve for a non-Euclidean space by just force them together. But as we tried a few times, we find that's quite non-trivial. So, so yeah, that, that is an open question. I have two sort of related questions on the phononic mode. So mm -hmm. the, f the first part, I guess, is, you know, wh what does it mean to define temperature in the, in the TEM, right, in this, like, liquid cell TEM? Because, you know, these are, uh, is, is there even a well-defined notion of that that allows you to, you know, map out the connection between the modes and, you know, something like an effective temperature, and does it change over time? And then related to that, I guess, is, so you showed us, I, I think, pretty nice evidence that the single nanoparticle fluctuations look very Gaussian. But are the phononic modes Gaussian, or do they deviate from Gaussian due to the non-equilibrium conditions? Yeah, yeah, both of these are very relevant questions. So, so firstly, temperature. So I think we did not ex need to explicitly put in a temperature, right? So, so basically, when we do this, when we do this fitting, 
everything is in terms of KBT, so we don't really need to know what the KBT is. So, but uh, I think it is still, maybe Tian can chime in, I think it's still a good uh, approximation to say that uh, we can use equilibrium statistical mechanics to describe these vibrations for a certain period of time in the observation. Right. So, uh, sorry, what was the second question? Uh, whether or not the phononic merger actually does something. Right, so that we have not uh, characterized yet. I think uh, if we, I think actually in a much earlier on, on work, uh, I collaborated with Tian, we looked at uh, fluctuations of colloidal maxwell lattices, and there we do see that if you draw the whole distribution, you do see non-Gaussianness, so which represent the, the, the higher order interactions between the particles. Here we have not carefully, so to my knowledge, we haven't characterized it, but I think it must be there, yeah, which will be interesting to, oh, actually, I forgot to mention, the angular interaction here is indeed non-Gaussian, so, so so we only fit the second order, but as you look at it here, the energy is a double well, so, so there is non-Gaussianness here. We did not study that in terms of the phonon modes mapping, but it is there. Okay, <laughs> thanks for another question. Uh, okay, so uh, about the mm, uh, these curved spaces, right? So you gave example of platonic solids. Is there anything special about the curvatures or sort of the progression of curvatures that you need uh, for this uh, uh, for for the shapes versus? Uh, I mean. W w there is actual number, right, of, of the minimal curvature needed for them to be, uh, yeah. to be space filling, right? So either a speci anything special about this number, so they yeah, just... Yeah, that, that has been solved. It's basically how overlapped or how much, how yes, big yes. the gap so, is. So, so yeah, uh, but what are those numbers? Are they, uh, are they some magic numbers or just... Uh, just there is nothing, nothing peculiar so, about them. So you can have analytic expressions for uh -huh. them. I, I'm not sure like how magic. Yeah, can... I mean, presumably there are several, uh, uh, several ah, curvatures okay. you might have. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah that's, so, that's right, that's so, right. So, uh, so, so okay, uh -huh. so, so I think I, I know what you mean now. So basically you can give it different rules. So, so let me go to this. You can say here, I have five tetrahedra, I want to close it, that's one curvature. If I have only four tetrahedra, if I don't have this orange one, I can still close it, I just need a more curvature. Mm -hmm. That leads to a different polytope. So, so there are, if I remember it right, six regular polytope in four dimensions, mm -hmm. and that correspond to closing tetrahedra in different ways, closing octahedra in different ways. Mm -hmm. So there are only six of them, so you can show, yeah. Uh, only six of them, sorry, with positive curvature. <laughs> yeah. So saying both speakers of the session.